All right, good evening and welcome to lesson number 15 in Bibliology and Bible Overview taught by the New Covenant College here at the Institute of the New Testament Baptist Church of Dover, Tennessee. Last time we met together, we looked at an overview of the poetical books, and now we're going to round out the Old Testament and finish it up tonight as we will consider for our last section the prophetical books, the prophets. This portion includes all books from Isaiah to Malachi. So after you've finished the uh, poetical books with Song of Solomon there, you get into Isaiah through the rest of the Old Testament, we're talking about the prophetical books. First question we need to ask ourselves is, what is a prophet? What is a prophet? Well, uh, a prophet is one who is called by God to proclaim divine revelation. To proclaim divine revelation. Most of the time, when we think about the prophets, we're talking about, um, you're thinking of somebody in the Old Testament that wore camel's hair and stood on a hill with a big staff in his hand and screamed, Thus saith the Lord. And that is the caricature of a prophet. That is a prophet. But you, you need to understand there's more to it than just that. It's not just, we, we say in our, our common vernacular, when someone just says something that is profound, uh, or if they uh, say something that's very coincidental, we say, that's a, that's a guy's a prophet. right? But uh, we need to understand that the key to whether or not someone is a prophet is whether or not they are proclaiming divine revelation. And the Old Testament prophets fulfilled uh, the immediate role of preaching to the nation of Israel, preaching to the nation of Israel, they confronted sin and they ministered the gospel. That was their two key components of their message. They confronted the sins of their day and they preached the gospel. And we don't have time to get into all of that, uh, but you must understand that they were preaching the gospel. Same gospel that you and I believe for salvation today. They preached. But then they also fulfilled the ministry of predicting future events that would see their fulfillment after their ministry had ended. So they were predicting the future, in, in a sense. So there we understand that there's two different types of prophecy. The first is forthtelling. Forthtelling. Let's write this on the board here. Two uh, types of prophecy. One is forthtelling. And this is the type of um, this is the type of prophecy that does not involve the necessarily the communication of new revelation, but simply just the preaching and the proclamation of revelation. Uh, we can, and in the New Testament, and let me say I'm a bona fide, cessationist. I believe that God has given all of the divine revelation that he's going to give. There's a sense in which that when a preacher opens the word of God and forth tells it, he is prophesying. He is prophesying. And Paul kind of hints at that in 1 Corinthians. Even think about that in chapter 11 when he talks about prayer and prophesying. I believe that we can apply that to the forth telling of divine revelation. Um, but typically when we think of a prophet, we think of the second definition of prophecy, which is foretelling. Foretelling. So forth and foretelling, big difference, little grammatical change. Foretelling is the predicting of future events, the predicting of future events. And the reason for those predictions was, yes, to provide comfort to God's people, Right When Jeremiah predicted when the captivity was going to end, that gave them hope that there was coming an end to their struggle and strife. But it's also primarily and chiefly to confirm the veracity and the truth and the authenticity of God's word. My own father, uh, he lived 60 years as an atheist, as someone who didn't believe uh, in God, and he thought that the Bible was just a collection of fables and stories. And what God used to convert him at the age of 60 were the Old Testament prophets reading the prophecies that foretold of the coming of Christ and foretold of future events and then seeing how those events uh, were perfectly to the T fulfilled sometimes 800 or 900 years after they were given. 
And my dad said, either this is the biggest conspiracy that has ever been written, right, because they're lying about who Isaiah was and when he wrote, and they're lying about who Paul was and when he wrote, and uh, it's all just a big conspiracy, or this book is, there's something special about this book. This book is given by a, a sovereign, omniscient, omnipotent God. And that was the conclusion that the Holy Spirit brought my dad to, and he was able to see that this book is not just any old book, right? And it was the foretelling that brought him to that conclusion. So these are the two different types of prophecy. There's no more foretelling today. God has given all uh, divine revelation that will ever be given, but there needs to be some foretelling, some opening up of uh, the the word of God and declaring it. There's one preacher who said, if anyone says, thus saith the Lord, the next thing that comes out of their mouth better be scripture. And that is true. So um, that is what a prophet is, what he was called to do, what prophecy is. We need to understand the 12 books of the Bible referred to as the, um, or it, actually it's more than, than 12. There's, uh, you have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, and then you have the 12 minor prophets. So the 17 books referred to as the prophetical books are known as the writing prophets. So remember just how we said that um, the poetical books, there was poetry in other portions of Scripture, but yet these books that were poetical are characterized as such. Well, it's the same in the prophetical books. Elijah, for instance, was a prophet, but he was not a writing prophet in the sense that he does not have a book in the canon of Scripture named after him that was his writing and his ministry, right? So when we're talking about, for the rest of this class, when we talk about the prophets, understand that I'm talking about the 17 prophetical books. The writing prophets prophesied during the kingdom, exilic, and post-exilic period of Israel's history, and the emphasis of their ministries had to do with the sins of Israel and the captivity that God brought as a means of divine judgment and the promise of a future restoration and the salvation of the Lord. So that, those are the prominent themes all throughout the prophetical books. And again, uh, we've talked about how they're divided up, and there's really two chief ways that they're divided up. One is they're divided up between major prophets and minor prophets. And understand that this has nothing to do with the importance of the book, simply the length of the book. Your major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah. Uh, you can include Lamentations. Uh, it's kind of an appendix to Jeremiah in a sense. It's written by Jeremiah. So Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Those are the major prophets. And they're only the major prophets because they are the longest prophets. But then uh, you have... Uh, one book in the Hebrew Bible, it's 12 books in ours, and in the Hebrew Bible it was just known as the 12. And that makes up the minor prophets, and that's all of the books from Hosea to Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament. So you, you'll talk about the major prophets and the minor prophets, uh, but then the other way of dividing them up is uh, their ministries in relation to the exiles. You know, Judah went into Babylonian captivity, Israel went into Assyrian captivity, and so you'll hear people talk about the pre-exilic prophets or the post-exilic prophets. And then there's a couple prophets that began their ministries pre-exile and continued it into the exile. For instance, think about Daniel, who was carried away into captivity. Um, so you just need to be aware of these as you understand the context and the dividing up of the prophetical books. Some of the major themes in the prophets deal with Israel's land. Remember, Israel was promised a land in Genesis, and the land was received in Joshua. The land was lost by the end of Kings, and the rest of the Old Testament is basically a discussion of, are we ever going to get this back? You know, how do we return to faithfulness to the Lord? That's one of the themes. The justice of God is dealt with in the prophets. God deals justly with the nations, and God deals justly with Israel. The judgment of God, God will hold all men and nations accountable for sin. Uh, there is coming a day, I know it, it sometimes doesn't seem that way, when we look around at everything that's going on, it seems like the wicked are trampling the righteous, but you must remember, the Bible says, that even the wrath of man shall praise thee, and the remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. And you must understand that there is coming a day 
in which God will return in glory and he will make all things right and he will judge all things. And I believe that's, that began in the ministry of Christ. He was given a kingdom and his kingdom is growing and it is expanding and it is conquering the world through the spiritual breaching of the gospel and an ultimate victory will be consummated on the last day. And we see that in the prophets. Uh, we must live by faith, not by sight. Walk by faith, not by sight. So you, you turn on the news and you see that the wicked are winning, the wicked are, are advancing more and more, but you need to then turn to the Word of God, which says, no, uh, they might, in your short little blip on the map life of 50, 60, 70, 80 years, it might seem like the kingdom of God is just vanishing away. You need to trust the promises of the Word of God that say that Christ has given an everlasting kingdom, and the advance of his kingdom knows no end, the Bible says in the prophets. And then the, the final theme is the restoration of God's people through the Messiah, through the Messiah. Many, many prophecies and predictions of the coming of Christ and his work are contained in the prophetical book. So let's jump right into looking at these books. We'll just go in their canonical order, beginning with the major prophets. First is the book of Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied from 740 to 680 B.C. He had a lengthy ministry, and his ministry was to the Jews in the southern kingdom. The theme of the book of Isaiah is the salvation of Jehovah. That's what the name literally Isaiah conveys and means. And um, something that's interesting about Isaiah is that there's a parallel between the book of Isaiah and the Bible as a whole. Uh, the Bible has 66 books. Isaiah has 66 chapters. 39 books of the Old Testament, which primarily emphasize the, the law and the condemnation of those who break the law. And the first 39 books of Isaiah emphasize the same theme. Then you understand there's 27 books of the New Testament. And uh, there are 27 books of redemption in Isaiah, beginning with chapter 40. If you've ever studied through Isaiah you see that it just gets bleaker and bleaker and uh, uh, more condemning and more condemning. And then you get to chapter 40, and all of a sudden it's talking about the, the goodness of God and redemption and, and what a wonderful parallel that is between the Old Testament and the New Testament and the Bible as a whole. And perhaps more than any other prophet, Isaiah provides us with such an accurate foretelling of Christ that it is as if we have an eyewitness account of Jesus' ministry 800 years before he is born. Think about that glorious prophecy in Isaiah 53. I mean, does that not just paint a perfect picture of the work and person of Christ? I think that's why Isaiah has been rightly called by many scholars the gospel according to Isaiah, because it's just such a poignant picture of the Lord Jesus. The second of the prophetical books is Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Jeremiah is often called the weeping prophet or the prophet of loneliness, uh, chiefly for two reasons. One, because he writes with a very emotional connotation. And you can see that he's very vexed over the sins of his people. Uh, but he was also commanded by God not to marry. He, he lived a life. Uh, whereas Isaiah, I believe, I might be wrong, but I believe Isaiah's son, Meir Shalal Hashbaz, uh, had the longest name of anyone that was recorded in the Bible. Jeremiah had no wife and no children. Um, that is because the judgment that was to come upon them was so swift and so immediate that God used him as a, as a picture of, um, we don't have time to worry about family and, and, and taking a wife. We need to repent before God. That was the kind of the theme of Jeremiah's um, ministry. He prophesied from 627 to 585 B.C., also in the southern kingdom. However, uh, Jeremiah was taken away in Babylonian captivity, and he prophesied in the exile as well. Themes of, uh, of Jeremiah include the surety of judgment for sin and also the promise of restoration on the basis of genuine repentance. Uh, there where he says, break up your fallowed ground, if thou wilt, return unto me. Right? Lamentations. Uh, again, this can be a tricky book to categorize. Some consider it a poetical book, some consider it prophetical, and really it's, it's neither here nor there, neither right or wrong. Uh, it's just a, um, 
matter of preference or how you want to look at it. Uh, Lamentations is different than the other prophetical books in that it is largely poetical, but it was still written by Jeremiah, written by a prophet, uh, and kind of an appendix to the book of Jeremiah. It talks about the woes that befell the city of Jerusalem when it was destroyed by the Babylonian army in 585 B.C. And the prominent theme uh, of this book deals with the the chastisement that had come upon Israel and specifically upon the southern kingdom of Judah. Um, Again, it's written in a very poetic form, but it still tells of those specific events and prophesies about those specific events. Uh, The uh, third of the major prophets, uh, or the fourth book of the major prophets, however you want to look at it, is Ezekiel. Ezekiel. And Ezekiel's ministry was to the Jews in Babylonian captivity. To the Jews in Babylonian captivity. Ezekiel prophesied from 529 to 570 B.C. And the theme of Ezekiel is the condemnation of God, but also the promise of a future time of blessing and prosperity. And then the last of the major prophets is the book of Daniel. Daniel. Uh, Daniel is a unique book as it contains prophecy along with a great deal of historical narrative. So it's not just sermons or messages, but it's also uh, didactic teaching and showing the, the, uh, um, the progression of Daniel's life and ministry there in Babylon. Uh, his ministry spanned from 605 to 536 B.C. And you'll remember that at a young age, he was taken away in Babylonian captivity and uh, that is where his entire ministry took place. Remember, Daniel was, uh, became a statesman in Babylon, and God placed him in a prominent position there, uh, being able to minister with the kings of Babylon and really rub shoulders with the upper echelons of society. Um, I don't profess to know if there is one, uh, but perhaps God would raise up a Daniel here in the United States of America who would uh, be a trumpet of truth in even the civil government here in our day. The theme of Daniel, the exhaustive sovereignty of God, especially over the kingdoms of men. The, the exhaustive sovereignty of God, especially over the kingdoms of men. It is God that raises up kings. It is God that puts kings down. It is God that holds the king's hands like a uh, king's a heart like the rivers of water and turneth it whithersoever he will. Uh, one of the unique features of Daniel is that very well known 70 weeks prophecy, which details the events that span nearly five centuries, and that prophecy culminates in the person and work of the Messiah there in the 69th and 70th week. Um, Daniel also provides a lot of information concerning Christ's everlasting kingdom. You remember the the picture there of the statue, and you see the the kingdoms of the earth, but then there was a stone cut without hands that struck the feet of that statue and broke it to pieces and grew to a mountain that filled the whole earth. And that is a picture of our Lord's kingdom in the earth. So those are the major prophets, and then we'll take a quick swing at the minor prophets. We have first Hosea. Hosea ministered from 755 to 715 B.C. And Hosea demonstrates the faithfulness and steadfast love of God towards his covenant people. Hosea, as you know, married a harlot, married an unfaithful woman. And time and time again, God said, go back to her, go back to her, receive her again, be restored, be restored. And that pictures the spiritual adultery that you and I commit against God. Every time... We sin. We are being unfaithful to God. We are committing spiritual adultery. And yet God has never divorced us, and he's never put us away. In fact, he's promised that he'll never do so. And so that's the picture that we see there in the book of Hosea. Joel, uh, there's no certain date on the book of Joel, but Joel deals with the eschatological day of the Lord and the various things that would come to pass in the last days. Joel uh, has that prophecy that is then correlated in Acts chapter number 2 on the day of Pentecost. Amos, Amos is a little bit different than some of the other prophets. I like old Amos uh, because Amos was not a 
prominent statesman. Amos was not in the upper echelon of society, but Amos was a, it says he was a herdsman from the hills of Tekoa. He was a hillbilly, and uh, God used him uh, as one of his prophets, even though Amos said, hey, I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, right? But Amos had a very, um, a very direct and a very plain way of speaking, and he is where we get that famous line, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. And uh, it contains a message primarily consisting of judgment, but it does end with a reminder of hope, with a reminder of hope. Obadiah is the next of the minor prophets, and with only 21 verses, Obadiah is the shortest book in the Bible, shortest book in the Bible. And it reminds God's people that haughtiness and pride lead to a great fall. Haughtiness and pride lead to a great fall. Jonah, probably one of the most well-known prophets. Jonah uh, is approximately dated from 780 to 850 B.C., somewhere in that ballpark. And it's one of the most well-known stories in the Bible. Many, many lessons come from the book of Jonah. The God of Israel has compassion on the whole world. Not just on his people, Israel, but on the Gentile nations as well. Remember, Jonah was sent to go preach to the Gentiles. We see that God is sovereign over all things, including nature. God sent a storm, then he sent a big fish, uh, then he made the fish vomit up Jonah on a specific place, right, specific shore. So we see here that God is sovereign over the affairs of the world. We see that salvation is of the Lord. Jonah said that in Jonah 2 and verse 9. And we see that God will save all those who repent and turn to him. God will save all those who repent and turn to him. Matter of fact, the reason why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh is because he knew that God would save them. He knew that God would save them. Uh, Oh, how that would change our outlook in the ministry if we had that faith, that we know that we can preach the gospel knowing that God desires to save sinners, and he will save sinners. Sometimes I think if we're honest with ourselves as preachers, we get in the pulpit already thinking, well, no one's going to be converted here today. I don't know what I'm doing, right? But we need to have the faith of Jonah, even though it was a disobedient faith. But he knew that God was good and that God would be gracious to the Ninevites and he would grant repentance to them. Now we see Micah. Micah is dated uh, approximately from 740 to 690 B.C., so we're moving further and further along. And Micah demonstrates what happens when God's covenant people do not fulfill the stipulations of the covenant covenant that God makes with his people has blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience, and we see that pictured in Micah. Nahum. Nahum. Uh, It's hard to date the book of Nahum. Uh, Scholars believe it's somewhere between 663 and 612 B.C., somewhere in there, and they do that based on the dating of the fall of Nineveh. Uh, Jonah preached to them. They repented, and they got right with God, Uh, but then later in Nahum's ministry, they fell. They fell. And uh, it tells of the fall of Nineveh and God's retribution against the Assyrians who had taken the northern kingdom into captivity. Then we have the prophet Habakkuk, Habakkuk, um, who ministered around 600 B.C. And Habakkuk tells of the struggles within the prophet's own heart concerning the coming judgment upon the people of God. Um, Habakkuk is is one who sees what is coming, and he is distraught. And we need to kind of get this same spiritual mindset of Habakkuk and understand that God will not overlook sin. And we need to be very earnest in pleading with the souls of men to repent and turn back to God. Uh, Habakkuk contains that famous phrase in Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by his faith, or the just shall live by faith. And Um, This is quoted in three New Testament books, Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews. It's really, you could say that that, that Habakkuk 2.4 is kind of the theme verse for the whole book of Romans. As Paul there is just ironing out and laying out and putting up on the pedestal that it needs to be put on, the the doctrine of justification by faith. And God would use Habakkuk 2.4... Uh, both in the original, also through its translations and copyings in the New Testament, to convert many, many converts. 
It was Martin Luther who, when studying for his lectures in the book of Romans, came to that phrase, the just shall live by faith, that he was converted from the heresies of Roman Catholicism, which teaches a salvation by faith plus works. And he said, no, no, it's by faith alone, faith alone. And um, the Apostle Paul, same thing, was converted by understanding that justification was by faith. So, we see that in the book of Habakkuk. Uh, in Zephaniah, which is the next uh, of the minor prophets, he prophesied between uh, 630 and 625 B.C. And Zephaniah teaches us how the wicked kings hindered the morals and spirituality of God's people. It's really a rebuke to um, the leaders and the rulers there in Israel. And it promises the final vindication of God's justice and His supreme standard of morality. The vindication of God's justice and His supreme standard of morality. Then we have uh, next the book of Haggai, or Haggai. And the last three of the minor prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, are the only three post-exilic prophets. They prophesied after the exiles, after Israel had returned into the land. And their aim was to encourage and guide the remnant of Israel that had returned after the exile. Uh, this book comes from approximately 520 B.C., Haggai, that is, and it is the second shortest book in the Old Testament. It is comprised of four messages as given by the prophet, uh, but many, many significant truths are packed into this short book. Then we have the uh, prophet Zechariah, which is dated from 520 to 518 B.C., and it is designed to specifically encourage Israel and the rebuilding of the temple. So Haggai is more so of a spiritual um, encouragement and spiritual uh, preaching. Uh, Zechariah is more geared towards the restoration uh, of the temple. It's really focused on the temple, and it highlights the spiritual restoration of God's people as a religious people, preparing them for the coming of the Messiah. And then the last book of the Old Testament, the last of the minor prophets, is Malachi. Malachi. It is the last book written in the Old Testament, and it was recorded around 400 B.C. And Malachi wrote a wake-up call to Israel and to detail for them why it was that God was so displeased. You'll remember those questions that Malachi asked. You say, wherein have we robbed God? Well, in tithes and offerings. And you say, wherein? And how did we do this? Uh, and Malachi says, I'll tell you how you did it, right? And so it's, a, it's a really a shot in the arm for the people of Israel. It's a wake-up call for them. And uh, a very uh, somber uh, truth about Malachi is that after Malachi was written, God would not speak to his people. There was no divine revelation. There was no miracle. Uh, there were no prophets. There was nothing for 400 years. 400 years, and uh, do a study on your own sometime of that intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and see just the spiritual decay and corruption that took place with the people of Israel. When we leave God's appointed means of service and worship, we um, forget how to live the way He's prescribed for us to live. The Judaism that was produced in that intertestamental period, is nothing like the religion of Moses. The rabbinical Talmudic Judaism that was on the scene when the Lord Jesus was incarnate um, is totally different than the Old Testament people of God. The book of Malachi has many applications for the New Testament church, has many somber warnings for us today, and I believe that's one of them. And this should also remind us that oftentimes, we read a passage of Scripture or we hear a sermon that comes to us as a rebuke and as a judgment, and we want to get all down in the dumps about it. We want to think, oh, that's so harsh, that's so harsh, I wish I didn't have to hear that. We ought to just be thankful that God is still speaking to us. You know what gives me hope uh, for our country here today or what should give you hope for wherever you're watching this from is, yes, there are evils in this world, but there's still men of God preaching the Word of God. There's still those who are standing for righteousness. You might say, well, it seems like there's less of them than there are on the other side. Well, maybe that, that's how it is right now. But God is still speaking. God is still sending men. God is still uh, raising up men to preach the Word of God. He's still planting churches. 
and we can trust that uh, he will win the ultimate victory. Um, so, the prophetic books, the prophetical books, compose a rather large section of the Old Testament, so it's important for you to study them. Now, I understand that a lot of times they can be hard to understand. They can be hard to, to grasp. I've read portions of some of these prophets. I'm just thinking, what is he talking about? <laughs> but a diligent study will bless the Christian with principles for his daily life and glorious, glorious pictures of the Lord Jesus given by divine revelation before his earthly ministry ever began. Uh, in the prophets, we get to see what kind of sins God really hates and God wants his people to have nothing to do with. I understand that there is a transition between the Old Testament people of God and the New Testament people of God. Um, there is a difference between the assembly in the Old Testament and the New Testament church. But understand that it's still the same spiritual people. It's, God has one people. He doesn't have two people. And Paul, in Romans 10, makes that analogy. He says, our fathers were in the wilderness, and we all drank of that same spiritual drink, and we all ate of that same spiritual meat, and the rock that you know followed us was Christ, right? And so when you're reading about God rebuking Old Testament Israel and the prophets, you can make application in those rebukes to your life today. And so uh, it's very applicable and something that we, as the Lord's people, need to study and need to know. And what a wonderful thing it is to find that solidarity there with the one elect people of God from the beginning of this world to the end of this world. Um, we see that here in the prophetical books. So that will conclude our study. We've overviewed the entire Old Testament. And next time when we meet together, we will begin looking at the New Testament with the New Testament historical books. So thank you. I hope this was a blessing and God bless you.